Uh, hello. Uh, so today uh, we are going to have uh, our uh, last chapter in object-oriented programming. We are going to talk mostly about polymorphism in object-oriented languages. And the way of achieving polymorphism uh, goes through inheritance and the generic abstractions. Uh, then we have some couple of missing points we uh, skipped so far, uh, like class members, and then finish uh, object-oriented programming. Uh, so, uh, in my previous video, actually, I had a spoiler for that. Uh, we had an uh, array of pointers uh, of uh, shape methods, and we uh, randomly uh, assigned uh, different objects of subclasses like circles, rectangles, etc., to the shape pointer. And we try to get uh, the function calls of the uh, pointers. Uh, so at runtime, we didn't know uh, which actual data type they are pointing to. Uh, and they all uh, throw the same shape. And this is an example uh, of uh, that kind. So uh, let us remind uh, first that example from the last spoiler version. So it was this one. I have this uh, shape text uh, circle uh, inheritance. Uh, so text and circle uh, derived from shape. Uh, and at runtime, dynamically, I assign this shape pointer pi value either of this shape, text, or circle. So I cannot know in advance, and compiler cannot know in advance which uh, shapes are assigned to those pointers. And then we call draw off each shape and try to get that. As a result, we get this output, and each uh, uh, shape drawn actually they call this one. They didn't call text, and they didn't call the circle. circle if you like but uh, it doesn't change the uh, output the output will be just shape draw the reason is very simple because uh, of uh, static uh, binding uh, since I am calling pi draw the type of pi is shape pointer and I am dereferencing and I get what I as a result I am going to get a shape and I am calling draw out of that shape. So my pointers are getting this shape draw and this is uh, called uh, static binding as you know uh, from the early uh, weeks of the lecture uh, early weeks of the course uh, so basically uh, also, uh, in the last video, I told you to try that with Python, or if you like Java, and you would get something else, some different results, because they are doing this uh, dynamic binding or runtime binding for uh, class hierarchies. So uh, this uh, example is the simplified version of the pretty much same thing. So we have A, B is derived out of A, uh, and we have get method. We assign address of A to P and try P get, and address of B on P and try P get. So you will get static binding. As a result, you will get A get, A get, regardless of the content of the P being a B type object or A type object. 
this is something we uh, don't like much. Uh, we like to get some runtime behavior, some uh, dynamic behavior, and which we are going to call this late binding. And in order, in order to achieve a late binding, what you need to do is you need to put one extra keyword here, which is virtual. So uh, we used virtual for multiple inheritance. Uh, this is not related to that, uh, but pretty much some, carrying some runtime information is the uh, common uh, idea in both of them. So here, addition of this, uh, get uh, the virtual keyword on get, will delay its binding to runtime. So it will carry some runtime information to bind get. As a result, you will get now uh, the output here. First one, a type object, so it will get a get. The second one will get not a get, but b get. Thanks to what? Thanks to uh, get being defined as virtual. Uh, this is sometimes called late binding, sometimes it's called runtime binding, uh, but the idea is just carrying that information at runtime to get that difference. So now I have uh, an example. Uh, uh, before example, I would like to explain you this, which is the special really strange syntax definition. So this is a member function, a method. You define it as, without curly braces, you define it as zero. A really strange syntax, but the uh, idea is, uh, the uh, user defines f as a virtual abstract function. And it, this is a way of saying that I am not going to implement this and you are not going to use this. So I just put this as a placeholder, not implemented, so that you cannot implement it or you cannot use it, you cannot call it, and which will make my class this one as abstract members and which will make my class an abstract class. You cannot instantiate an abstract class, so you cannot create an object out of them. Uh, they look like uh, useless, but they are not. Uh, we are using that like a, a placeholder or a template so that we can build on top of them. So it is like the basement of our class hierarchy that you cannot instantiate. As you put new classes uh, derived from this class that implements F, now you can instantiate them. Uh, this is pretty much the equivalent uh, besides the member attributes, the member variables equal to Java interfaces. In Java, you cannot define uh, member attributes. So you cannot have variables within an interface. Uh, in uh, C++, uh, abstract classes can have uh, member variables. Besides that, they work pretty much in the same way. Uh, so now let us have this thing in mind. Let us have our uh, example, uh, I have a slightly modified version of our shape example. So, so we have uh, our base class shape. The base class shape has x, y coordinates and the colors. And it has a draw function which is defined as initialize to zero, this, this will make this member an abstract member. So you cannot instantiate shape class. If you like, I can show it to you. Let us instantiate this shape class with try to compile that. Your compiler will uh, give you exactly the same error. Shape is an abstract class. Uh, unimplemented pure, pure virtual method throw in shape, so you cannot instantiate it. Okay. Uh, 
another term uh, for this type of uh, methods or number functions is pure. So it is pure virtual method. So I am not allowed to instantiate that, but I can derive a new class square out of it like this. If you remember, I can call inner shape constructor this way. And this has an extra uh, variable, which is width, the width of the square. So square offset is coming from shape, the uh, abstract class. And I add w as width uh, to define it and make it a square. Uh, and draw function is something fancy. Uh, we have uh, lines passing from, uh, starting from x, y, offset width, offset width, offset width. So we have we draw four lines uh, or a uh, group of lines on those four points. Uh, the circle is something similar, but it has a radius instead of the width. It draws a circle blah blah, so it draws a circle primitive. Now, since I have implemented this draw, now I can instantiate square and the shape as in the uh, main, like this. Now, I have a rectangle, nothing but uh, some additional height, so we'll have, again, four lines drawn, etc. So I have three uh, classes inherited uh, uh, out of shape and made it a concrete class, so not abstract, but concrete class. This is another term, so abstract class versus concrete, concrete class. If you got rid of all of the uh, abstract members, the pure uh, functions, uh, the class becomes uh, now concrete class. Inherited class becomes concrete class. So now we will have something interesting. I believe you know what will happen if you call uh, draw on a rectangle pointer or uh, draw on a square pointer. They will uh, call their uh, corresponding uh, actual implementations, the concrete implementations. But what about this? This is the point uh, where our example gets more interesting. Uh, so in this member function, which is a shape member, by the way, it calls draw, uh, updates the offsets, Called draw again, so it is like a, a mimic of uh, if I would like to draw a shape, uh, if I li like to move a shape, I draw it with the background at the exact same location, so it will be invisible again, and set a new offset and draw it with the foreground color. So now I will have a new um, uh, new positions it will be displayed so it will be moved from this one to this one so it is a silly and very simple way of uh, drawing an object draw with backgrounds move it then draw it again but interestingly i'm calling draw which is a pure function in shape twice uh, however since the binding of draw is uh, delayed uh, this move uh, function is going to call the concrete class draw. As a result, if it is a rectangle, I am calling shape function, but it is moving a rectangle. I am calling shape function, but it is going to move a circle. And let me show you the evidence. I have S move, C move, R move. Okay, and S move, C move, and R move, and you are going to see how they work. If I call this, you are going to see. So this one is 
these two are square move, these two are circle move, background, red, and these are the uh, rectangle move, okay? So rectangle is similar to uh, the uh, square, but only the lengths are different. Uh, so this will uh, give you some clue about the polymorphism. You are defining a move function, and actually it is operating on different types of uh, classes in a uniform way, and that, that was the definition of polymorphism, if you remember. Okay. Uh, in order to uh, make this example more interesting, I have a follow-up, and I define the same, I do this pretty much the same thing. I define an array of shape pointers and pointers, and at runtime, dynamically, based on a random number generated value, 0, 1, 2, I define a rectangle or a square or a circle and assign it to PI. So at runtime, until runtime, I don't have any idea about PI. Then in a loop, I, what does that mean? Let us comment out this. And as you can see, I have, depending on runtime, I have uh, a rectangle, a circle, a uh, rectangle or circle, so I cannot distinguish uh, them. So if you like, let us add some descriptors. So it will be our lines, the rectangle will be our lines. So a rectangle, uh, a square or a rectangle or a circle, depending on runtime, since it's a random number, it is going to have a different outputs at each time I invoke it. So uh, this uh, dynamism through move or directly gives us uh, an ability to write polymorphic functions in C++ as long as we have uh, inheritance relation. Uh, so I have uh, another example, but I'm uh, leaving it for the following slides. Uh, keeping them for that uh, later. Uh, so this is pretty much the example I have shown you. These draws are bound to runtime uh, concrete implementations. And as a result, we get the desired objective. Uh, this idea is called an interface in Java. And it is used pretty uh, many uh, examples in, in libraries and uh, class libraries and so on. The idea is it is called an interface in Java and I can have um, a class uh, not deriving or extending, but uh, implementing the interface. So our keyword now in Java world is implement. Uh, and uh, in Java, there is no multiple inheritance, but there is multiple implements, so you can have many interfaces implemented by a class. So uh, the result will be uh, the uh, person implementing this list and, and swap operations, for example. As a result, uh, all functions working on this interface uh, can work on person or work on complex. And this is how we show that. So this is the interface implementation. Uh, this is the extension uh, or inheritance. If it is dashed, it is uh, implementation. Uh, so if you define a sort function working on sortable, then it can sort persons, complex, and so on. So let us have that example. Uh, I have 
one with me. Okay, it is here. I have two examples actually. Uh, one is called Resort Java. And so I define my interface. As I said before, interface, there is no member variable. Uh, only constants can be defined. Uh, only functions. And those functions are by default uh, pure functions, so they cannot have implementations within the interface. Uh, then I have a single uh, with this implements keyword sortable. I say that I am going to implement all pure functions in this interface. And so I do. Okay, here I define less than relation. I get another sortable object. And if their x values are uh, compared and if x is less than uh, x value of uh, the parameter actually do I need that I don't think I need that okay I convert that into a single object and uh, I return true otherwise false and uh, there is a swap operation similarly I swap the contents of uh, two objects. So I have a current object and Q. I uh, uh, swap X content so they will have uh, their values exchanged. And I dump uh, the content this way. Complex implements the sortable similarly here and it swaps the complex values. So I have X and Y uh, values as complex. And uh, then I have this, uh, this is like uh, the main functions, global functions uh, put into a class. In Java, everything has to be class in a class. So this is the main class of my application. And this gets a list of sortable objects. Actually, they, they are references. And, and many of them, and I am lazy, so I only implemented something like, I believe, selection sort. Uh, if not pi less than pj, pi swap so pj, so if they are not uh, compared, uh, if they are not uh, sorted uh, the way I like, I uh, swap them. And this sort function is a polymorphic function. It doesn't know anything about the actual a class uh, it is sorting it is getting a uh, array of uh, object references and just source them without knowing what they are and the same thing here i have uh, uh, 10 objects initialize this way and i sort them with my sort function and dump them, output them. I get 10 complex values, sort them, and dump them. As you can see now, I have a polymorphic function which can uh, sort both uh, complex and single values. Okay, let us see if Java is. Uh, I don't know if I have a Java compiler here, but let us try. Java C, Polysort Java. Looks like it is working so far. So I believe I don't have Java. I can have. Uh, Same example here, I believe. Okay, 
ABC sort here. Okay. Okay, now this is the output of that. So this is the single value sorted, and these are the uh, complex values sorted in the way I like they implement. Uh, let us uh, try that same example in C++ uh, with abstract classes instead of interfaces pretty much in a similar way. Uh, okay, this one. Pretty much I have the same thing since I don't have a different uh, uh, type like interface i use the class and make it an abstract class through this uh, set to zero get the sortable pointer swap and so on and this is my sort operation as you can see it sorts through this uh, abstract uh, member calls and this is the less than implementation uh, i need to uh, have some pointer conversion like this and return their comparison values. And this is how swap is implemented. Again, I have to convert this Q pointer into uh, the single pointer in order to access it uh, as a single. Uh, by the way, you may need to use uh, safer versions of that. I'm going to talk about that as well. And this is the complex sorts. Okay, pretty much the same example. Only thing ch uh, changing here is I have to I have to make this type conversion here. So the values are single values. I need to convert them into their sortable pointers uh, array, same as in the complex and if I compile them. Get pretty much the same results with Java. So this is ported from Java to C++ and so on. Uh, so this is how interfaces work and uh, actually this uh, should have been uh, familiar to you from our uh, encapsulation of type system chapter, I believe. In the type system chapter, we talk about this uh, and gave examples about Haskell. So this is the Haskell type class uh, kind of uh, type relation and polymorphism implementation. Uh, so how this is uh, possible? How C++ do this? Actually, there is no magic behind that. The idea is very uh, simple. Uh, the uh, C++ adds an extra pointer, and only an extra pointer, not per uh, virtual uh, function or pure function, but just a single pointer denoting the actual data type of uh, the object. So uh, the size of object will be a one pointer larger. Uh, it is called V pointer. So thanks to that, now we will have such a structure. So each object has a V table. If uh, there is a, a pure uh, method or not pure, a virtual method in uh, parent classes or this class, it adds this pointer. And this pointer points to actual map of uh, that data type. So per data type, per class, we have a table, and this table points to that table. So in each object, I carry extra pointer, which carries out this table. So you can have thousands of objects, uh, but per data type only have one uh, table, and those thousands of objects point to same table or a couple of tables. 
Uh, and in that table, each uh, virtual function has an offset. So what I need to do is I am going to get the table, dereference it, take the offset I'm looking for, F in the first, G is in the second, and so on. Compiler knows that. Compiler, during compilation, knows which uh, is put in which offset because compiler is putting those entries. And they point to the actual implementations. So in our example here, uh, F and G are virtual, and in B only G is overwritten. And that means F has specific implementations, uh, sorry, F has the same implementation, AF, and G has the specific implementation, AG versus BG. And an object B will point to this table, object of A will point to this table. And when you call PG in a pointer, it goes V table, take the second element, talks at two, and access that function. This is how we uh, achieve this uh, polymorphism and late binding in uh, C++ with some extra pointer there, the reference. Okay. okay, so this is some extra thing I would like to add this year. Uh, it is runtime type inference. Uh, this information here uh, is not the only information. The compiler can add uh, more information here, actually. Uh, the name of the class, the unique name of the class somewhere. As a result, we have some of the uh, type information available at runtime through uh, adding this header and using this type ID function. If you provide a type ID followed by a class name, it will return a type info object and that type info object is comparable and it, you, it will give you some uh, mangled name. So it is not the one-to-one uh, -one name, but it is uh, the internal representation of that name. Uh, so thanks to that, uh, I can do some uh, runtime uh, checks of data types. Uh, by the way, this is only valid. This type ID is only uh, valid for um, okay, no, no, so, sorry, not. The type ID uh, can be used this way uh, if you use this type info uh, header. Uh, another uh, extra facility we can get is this dynamic cast. So instead of uh, old school C type casts, uh, we have used in our examples, so converting pointer, shape pointer, etc. We can use dynamic cast pointer, which will use this runtime information to make sure that types are compatible before returning you something. So you are, for example, here, uh, PC is of type uh, C pointer, C class pointer, and you are trying to cast it to C pointer. Uh, actually, PC, uh, you can make this A if you like, okay? A, a, a pointer object, PA. You, have, you are trying to convert it into C star. But what if, if it is not C star? In old school, C style pointer uh, conversions, this will not be a problem uh, at compile time. and or uh, So it is going to give you the value with missing value. So you may have dangling references, invalid calls, and so on. So you, you will end up in uh, some... Uh, memory fault and so on. However, in uh, dynamic cast, if this conversion is not possible among this uh, actually obj actual object that this pointer points to, and uh, this object you like, if this is not possible, this is going to return null. So at runtime, you can do this. If uh, PC is null, do something. And this will give you uh, that flexibility. So let's make this PA instead. Uh, and this is called runtime type inference. Uh, and uh, this is actually a family of cast operators. 
Also, you can do this one quite use, uh, useful. You have two base pointers, and you like to make sure that they are the same type object. You can do this way. Uh, or you can get the name uh, of the object and so on. Uh, so now this polymorphism gives us uh, an important uh, flexibility, but this is not the only way you can get uh, polymorphism in uh, C++ or object-oriented languages. Uh, some languages provide something we call generic abstraction so that we can have uh, this uh, flexibility of defining polymorphic uh, classes and functions. In C++, this is called templates. It is called template metaprogramming approach. So the idea is uh, you have a definition preceded by a template. That means that definition is expanded as being instantiated. As you use that definition, as you use that uh, type, it is instantiated automatically by the compiler. So at compile time, this is important, at compile time, compiler generates new versions of your declarations as if it was uh, expanding a macro. Okay. Uh, each distinct usage, like vector person or vector int, vector double, etc., creates a new instance out of your vector definition. Uh, and uh, together with the overloading, uh, this will end up in some sort of uh, polymorphism. Uh, functions work in the same way. You can have uh, functions preceded by templates. As a result, each use of function with different arguments will end up in uh, a different function expanded and different instantiation of the same function body. Uh, this uh, is some sort of parametric polymorphism and it is provided at compile time. Uh, that means we have an important restriction here. In order to take advantage of this parametric polymorphism, you need source code. So you cannot compile it once and deliver it as a binary uh, with your uh, code. Just a moment. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, the, um, uh, it, on the other side, it is very efficient because it is uh, compiled code and there is no difference between calling a regular function or a template function, regular class versus a template class. Uh, in Java, uh, they didn't have generics until like uh, version five, I believe. Uh, then they decided to include it and the uh, uh, Java generics are, is different than C++ uh, templates because uh, only uh, class parameters can be supported. You cannot have primitive values, uh, primitive data types. Uh, in this uh, type of uh, generics, uh, it is only one copy of the class, class functions are in, uh, are generated. So it is uh, runtime parametric polymorphism. So we don't have multiple versions of the same function as it is in C++. And type checking is done at compile time. However, binding is uh, done at runtime, okay? So, uh, Compiler only makes sure it types are safe, then leaves everything until runtime. In Java, all object values are references and memory functions are virtual. And by using that, uh, Java generics takes advantage of this uh, built-in uh, polymorphism to get uh, runtime polymorphism. So the advantage of uh, Java generics is actually it is uh, it is making this um, uh, everything in the uh, runtime, so you can compile, for example, your Java code and distribute it as a binary uh, compiled form. And at runtime, people can use your uh, existing uh, 
Java implementation. You don't have to give the source code, for example. This is not uh, something too serious, but if you like to protect your source code, Java lets you do this. Uh, so let us have um, examples on those templates. I prepared you a very simple polymorph polymorphic uh, binary search tree. And this here. So here what I do is I precede this class declaration with this template, which makes this TA type variable. Uh, so in the body of the tree class, I can use T as a data type like alpha in Haskell, so it's like a variable. So as I use a tree this way, it is going to expand all the class definition as if t is replaced by integer. So it, will, it is going to expand the tree int so that there is an integer So it is going to make this expansion. It is going to generate this one automatically. If I use person, it is going to expand this like this. And this way it will generate all possibilities for that from only one definition. Okay. Uh, and this is the uh, how you define, uh, so you can either define this functions here in line, or if you like to define them outside, you have to repeat the template keyword. This is one of the uh, syntax choices uh, I feel not intuitive when I uh, learned it for the first time. You have to repeat the template, so you don't have any chance to have this curly brace of the template and put many declarations. That's why for each implementation uh, of a member function outside class, so I'm implementing this insert actually, you have to repeat this template. And now you are not implementing tree anymore. You are implementing tree of t insert. Okay. So in this way, you define all of the functions. This is boring binary search tree insert, etc. And this is the destructor I am too lazy to fill in. You should actually make a deep traversal of the tree and the allocation here. So traverse and allocate here. So let us put a tool here. Uh, and this is for traversal of the tree. And now, uh, thanks to that, Now I can have uh, people tree, person tree, and double tree. I can insert any value I like. And this way I have, uh, uh, I believe this is inverse sorted, something like that. Okay, the surname sorted uh, list uh, can we get this way. But we have a trick here, uh, not trick, but uh, a tricky point here, uh, which is my implementation of insert is using, for example, this less than operator. And it uses also, yes, it uses less than operator. So I need to implement that. So as C++ expands a definition, for example, for integer, it is expanding that definition. It will try if that data type less than can be called. So otherwise, it is going to give a syntax search like I'm about to get one. I commented out this integer less than and compile it again. And now, as you see, it complained that we have an integer to integer less than referenced 
but it doesn't exist. Uh, so you have to make sure that they are uh, accessible. So let me show you uh, the, uh, so the, you can try this on your own. Uh, you can uh, compile this. So this is uh, for compiling a dynamic library. So I compiled instead of uh, main function, I compile it as a dynamic library. Uh, if you, uh, of course, there is main here. If you strip down main and compile the shared library. You won't see any implementation because you didn't use it. So, uh, okay, it does not give much time, but I mean this one. comment of the main part and I would like to make a library out of this and compile that and if you compile that compiler will not complain about that but it's not going to put any definition in lib3 because they are not instantiated the integer version person version etc is not instantiated and user is trying to define something else like for example a student plus so it is not available at uh, compile time so it is not going to be available I can show you how this is possible later, but uh, now let us switch to Java and how it works in Java. And this is my Java implementation. I believe it is here. This is my tree implementation. And this is my generic uh, T extends uh, tree content. So it is like an uh, interface, etc. Uh, we have insert, traverse, and so on. Uh, so the binary search implementation is inside of this class. It is like a library. You can compile it separately. Uh, and the content is nothing but just an interface, compare and show. And now in my three main Java, I can implement a person of three contents. That means I would implement compare and show. Uh, and then I use person as three person. Syntax is pretty much similar to C++ as a new three person. And then I insert all of those names and it's going to give me uh, their values. So I compile it. Java here. It's not good. It will give you this binary search tree traversal uh, in this way. And uh, actually, you don't have much time, but I could have shown you that you can compile this uh, Java class, class separately and yet write your own uh, main class uh, without the source code and uh, compile into this tree main in any way you like. You can use it. Uh, so this shows you the difference between Java generics and C++. Uh, pretty much we use this template argument and to generate uh, values. Uh, actually, I have I have an example for this. Uh, as well, I'm using the polymorphism here, uh, this version. But this is my header. I have an abstract class. Uh, uh, actually, I have a tree, but three nodes are comparable objects. So this is a polymorphic data structure. I'm using comparable objects instead of a concrete class objects. Uh, 
pointers and I define insert servers in the way I like. I call their compare methods if I need to compare. And I use their show methods if I like to show the objects. And in this way, I define this tree without uh, templates, without generics. And then if I compile them, uh, it is going to give me uh, every, everything I need. Uh, I don't have the concrete class here, but I have a list version of that as well. This compare us, so this is the actual thing. Get the list inserted as the person tree, and it will work. Okay. Uh, I can give you more examples on those uh, later. So uh, this is uh, Java generics and how uh, I achieve that. Uh, now, so this is uh, the um, polymorphism in object-oriented languages. Uh, one, two, virtual uh, classes, proof functions, or interfaces in Java. I can have late finding. As a result, I will end up in polymorphism. Second, I can use generics uh, with templates or Java generics to end up in polymorphism. Parametric polymorphism. Uh, so this will finish the discussion of polymorphism. I have a couple of slides left. And in those slides, I would like to give you uh, an idea of what a class member is. So usually, uh, so far, we always use member variables that are uh, part of the objects. And uh, so if you instantiate a class a thousand times, you will have a thousand copies of those member variables inside of each object. Uh, one. Uh, so the, the problem here is instead of having those object per uh, the variable per object, can I have class based objects? So I would like to uh, do this. I would like to have a counter, for example, for my class so that I would know I would increment any time I constructed an object. And I am going to decrement it anytime I distract one, so that I would know uh, how many uh, objects currently alive. We can do this, and it is going to run well without any trouble. Uh, but we have one problem. Uh, the problem is I am using global variables. Okay, global variables inevitable. Sometimes you can use them. But this uh, global variable is outside of my object. And actually, it is part of my implementation, uh, basically implementation detail. But I use it as a global variable so that anyone can, by mistake, update this variable. So it is part of my interface, but it is not hidden. I don't like this. I don't want this one to be uh, accessible outside world. So I need to do all class-related variables, even though they look like global, within the uh, class boundaries. This, this is what, this is an old used keywords uh, static. So actually, so far we have uh, static local variables, which makes their lifetime global. Uh, we have uh, static keyword used for linker, it is not going to expose the various functions outside of the uh, current uh, binary object. And this is the third one. Uh, in this case, similar to this uh, static local variables, uh, this counter will be in scope of A. It can be accessed in scope of A. And if you make it private, it will be private. So only member functions can access. And uh, thanks to that, we uh, now made it a part of our detail uh, in our abstraction so that outside world cannot access it. However, the lifetime is uh, independent from the scope. So you have to start the lifetime of that variable. And you may choose to do it in some way you like. 
and this is the uh, global way. So actually the lifetime is global, but scope is class. How you define that? You declare a global variable, but you put your variable in the scope of A, so that it will be A's counter. Now this implementation will work without any problem. Uh, so this is one step. Uh, we can uh, use this uh, as a part of our implementation. Uh, we, if we need per class variables, we can use it this way. But we have one step further in a static world. Uh, what about this get counts? The get counts re responsibility is to return this counter. And I don't like this get count to modify x. So if you go back to here, this get count can modify x, but I don't like it because its purpose is related to counter, not x. Uh, so uh, this version can be called in object context, but I would like to call it in class context as well. So I can use get count if I make it static this way I can use it with this scope a get count I don't have to specify an object create an object and use it okay uh, and the nice thing is uh, you also put another restriction by mistake get count cannot modify x because this is a type restriction. Compiler will complain if you try to modify a, a non-static member variable. Okay? So you cannot access non-static members and static member functions. However, the reverse is not true. So non-static member functions can access both static and non-static. Okay? Uh, so this is uh, the static. It is uh, class members actually. It is. Uh, the class members are useful, especially in, in configuration. Uh, for example, you have a database connection and all your class depends on that. All your objects are sharing the same connection or some configuration of your application. Or uh, this many, uh, this like accounting purposes. Uh, and pretty much uh, one of the important usages is to create a singleton pattern. Uh, singleton is just um, uh, creating a single instance out of a class, no other instances allowed. And this is also uh, some mechanism behind that. Okay, uh, thank you very much for listening. All your questions are welcome on uh, the department forum. Uh, so, see you later.